Well, hello to all. Welcome to The Sacred Speaks. My name is John Price. I'm your host, and I'm pleased to bring you today's podcast participant, Ellen Petrie Leance. I will get to her bio and then give you a little bit of information you know, with some, uh, some external contacts, and then we'll jump right in. So in this episode, I talked to an acclaimed Silicon Valley innovator, former Stanford University instructor, TEDx speaker, and published author, Ellen Petrie Leance, who works at the crossroads of creative and scientific inquiry. Her career at Apple established her as a digital pioneer and the catalyst of history's first online connection between a technology company and its users. Continuing on this course, she challenged assumptions as an entrepreneur, as a leader at Google, in venture capital, and as a global innovation advisor. Ellen is the author of The Happiness Hack, a neuroscience-based guide to life satisfaction, the originator of popular Stanford courses including The Neuroscience of Creativity and Innovation, a TEDx speaker, Happiness by Design, and a globally followed keynote presenter. She contributes articles on ethics, leadership, functional neuroscience, and gender equality to publications including Huffington Post, Business Insider, Inc.com, CNBC, Self, and Women's Health. After leaving a C-level role at a technology company in 2022, she relocated to New Mexico to deepen her inquiry into indigenous philosophy and sustainable life ways. During this time, her coaching practice shaped future-facing leadership for founders, C-suite executives, nonprofit leaders, and investors in the U.S., Europe, and the Global South. In 2023, Ellen launched The Brain and Beyond, a podcast awakening audiences to time-proven ways of leading, living, and maintaining mental wellness. She maintains an active Buddhist practice and is the mother of three sons. Check her out at Ellen. Check her out. Check her out at Ellen Leance. E L L E N L E A N S E dot com and the brain and beyond dot com. Thank you, Ellen, for your participation on the podcast. Much appreciated. Always great to get connected with you. Thank you for your presence and your friendship. So, just a couple of directions I'm going to point you in. Of course, check out the Sacred Speaks podcast at thesacredspeaks.com. Check out our sponsor, the Center for the Healing Arts and Sciences at the Center for HAS.com. An a wellness practice that my wife and I created many moons ago. And of course, be looking forward to all kinds of offerings that the center has, including an online subscription model that we're opening up, and in particular, opening up for the Sacred Speaks community. That portal will be open in the next month, a couple weeks or a month. Be checking the center's website for the link. And for, I don't know how long it's going to be, but for the Sacred Speaks participants, we're going to offer a free membership trial. You can check it out and see what you think, and also help us get started. We're going to beta test for Narmati, N-A-R-M-O-T-T-I. Narmati is our online model. Uh, as always, check out the music from Modern Nations at modernnationsmusic.com. Uh, hang out till the end of the episode, and you will hear the full version of Clouds, the theme music for the podcast. And as always, check out the Young Center at younghouston.org. All kinds of great stuff going on there. I'm on the board and I'm quite involved in pushing that mission forward. Anything else? For now, I think that's it. So enjoy the episode again. Thank you, Ellen. And for now, we'll leave it there. Ellen, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. Like, as I was saying, getting, getting a couple of your podcasts in well-produced, well done, you know, you're so articulate on these subjects. You and I've had many exchanges in preparation for this, just random road trip conversations, you know, like great, great in, in the, in the in-between spaces. Um, mm -hmm. So we've been talking about doing this for a long time and I'm really glad you're here. I'm so glad to do this and it's just, it's hitting at the right time. So I'm, I'm glad we finally committed to get this done. I'm so glad to, John. It's great yeah. to be here. Yeah, you. It's great to have you here. Um, and so, uh, just to begin, where where we started talking, um, we immediately got into um, this this confluence point between the structures of the brain and social expression, certainly identity. We were talking about left right brain dominance and mm -hmm. how that manifests in a culture and the ways in which the kind of left brain. Um, 
dominance in our culture has contributed to a very kind of what we could we would call maybe a masculine individualistic materialistic mechanistic modes of consciousness let let's start there and kind of set that up and then we'll go through everything and, and get into all these great subjects we're going to talk about well clearly you know my favorite <laughs> topic right <laughs> yes totally totally so, for the really for the just for the audience because this is such a fun thing for us to talk about and really a fun thing for yeah. any of us to talk about it's really important to know that the brain is made up of several functional and operational parts each of which is quite different from the, the other parts both um, anatomically but also neurochemically and through hormones and so forth and by the way, if we get to it, we could talk about some of the differences between male and female brains, because as controversial as that topic is, there are some differences that are worth calling out. Basically, the way I look at the brain is sort of in, in five compounds. I look at the prefrontal cortex, which is the most ancient, <laughs> oh, the prefrontal cortex, which is actually the newest part yeah. of the brain. It's the part that's right here in the forehead. We also have a left hemisphere, a right hemisphere an area that unifies them and actually works as an exchange, but also interestingly an inhibitor called the corpus callosum. And then at the back, we have all of the things about the, you know, the hind brain and the, mm -hmm. um, the different parts of the brain that are really much more about interacting with the body and about really the ancient technologies that favored survival. Mm. I'm a big believer, as anyone who listens to my podcast knows, that I, I see the brain extending way down through the spinal column, um, the spinal cord into the body and through the central nervous system. I think it's just a convenience of sort of Cartesian uh, illustrations, <laughs> amputations in science that said that we can understand this whole by breaking it down into parts, yeah. which is a big part of materialism, actually. Totally. So I look at the brain in a really interesting way, and I'm certainly not the first. If we dial back many, many, many thousands of years and we look at Taoist texts around yang and yin, we will see very accurate depictions of the tendencies of the androgen-driven brain, which is the mm. left hemisphere, and the estrogen or other hormone-driven brain, which is the right hemisphere. And all I can say is that they are meant to be better together. But anyone knows that a brain wires what it fires. Yeah. And in a culture and a society where we are much about much more about the linear pursuit of outcomes about binaries, about categorization and classification, about looking at parts to understand the whole, mm -hmm. rather than looking at big picture, vastness, non-duality, uh, context, connection, meaning, things like that, which is much more of the right hemisphere. We are by use, I think, pathologically overactivating the left hemisphere of the brain. And I believe this is causing a number of the overarching concerns and challenges we are being invited to face today in modern mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let's pause there because I want to pick that thread up. But would you give? Uh, really, it's it's my opportunity to get to know you in a different way too. And uh, would you give a bit of background so we can see the setup for how you became an expert on this subject? And then we're going to dip in right there because I think that's an important point of looking at culture and. Um, the ways in which we've we're a little off balance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to. So, um, I grew up in Sal in San Jose, California, Silicon Valley before it was Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. and I was a nerdy kid and an arty kid, and I was given so many messages. You know, in everywhere I turned, I couldn't be both a nerd and an artist. I had to choose one. Um, and that never made sense to me. Yet, as I looked at the world around me, I saw that there, there, there were divides. And, you know, it might have been a function of me growing older. It might have been a function of times changing or something like that. But I increasingly felt that I, that adults with my best interest at heart, I'm sure, wanted to pigeonhole me into either pursuing something more in the sciences or the mm -hmm. world of business or something like that, or saying, oh, she's just an artist, like that sort of thing. Whereas I didn't see art as something I did. I saw it really as intrinsic to my identity, my, my sense of myself. So for some reason, I was lucky enough to just be able to ignore those messages and kind of have my closet artist, you know, very active and very <laughs> engaged, even while I went on and did things in school and so forth. And when I graduated from school, um, I had a pretty significant accident. 
And as a result of that, the plans that I had, which involved some really neat travel and working in another country, got sort of, you know, uh, those, those got shifted because I wasn't in a position to travel. And when I was healthy um, and ready to get on with my life, it was time for me to get a job. And I didn't have the resources to go back to pursue that travel opportunity. It was no longer available to me anyway. And so I started applying for jobs in Silicon Valley, which is mm. where I was living because that's where my parents lived. They were still in San Jose. And around that time, I must have sent out a hundred or more than a hundred letters that I typed out on an IBM Selectric and, you know, lick the envelope and put them in the mail as one did back in the mid eighties you know, or early eighties, excuse me. And I swear, John, that for every letter, job application I sent out, I got three rejection letters in return. It's so painful. Yeah, yeah. It, it was. I was like, what's going to happen here? Yeah, you know? yeah. So, but it, and they all came from companies that had these very sort of, very sort of boxy-like names, like Sis this or Compu that or so forth. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, I don't even remember sending an application letter to Apple. But when I went to that, mailbox one day and I pulled out an envelope that had in the top left corner a uh, six color rainbow apple the minute I looked at it because mind you it was black and white in the San Jose Mercury News where I probably applied for a job the minute I looked at it I had two thoughts one of them was this company gets it that business and creativity don't have mm. to be isolated from one another and mind you at the time we had no vocabulary around design thinking or anything like that it was just mm. pretty binary business or this and then the other thing I thought was I hope it's not a rejection letter mm. and it was but there was something about it I, it was that apple I called the number on that rejection letter I still know the number by heart <laughs> and I told the poor recruiter on the other end of the line I think you made a mistake and I, I really pitched her. I go, you don't understand. Like, look at your logo. Da, 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 da. And she said to me, well, you know, I'll tell you something. There is a job that came up a few days ago. Maybe you'd like to hear more about it. So long story short, I joined Apple in 1981. And I worked for the company as an employee for about nine years and did some fairly innovative things there, technically innovative things. Wow. Um, Apple was the first company to have an online slash digital presence on the proto internet with its users. And that was in 1985, long before any other company had mm -hmm. done it. Mm -hmm. And that was something I did. It was a right place, right time sort of thing. Yes, by all means. Yet something in my ability to sort of see the, the what business was about in a linear fashion, but also see what human experience about made me literally fight to make that happen. And it changed quite a few things in the history of the company and in other companies. So even though I didn't have vocabulary for it, John, I was understanding the duality of, you know, sort of like how I was supposed to be and how I wanted to be in a way that as I look back on it is pretty hemispheric. Mm -hmm. And as I, after I left Apple, started a family, had a business in the arts, a flourishing business in the arts, there was a lot that I missed about tech in the world of business. But that's when I started asking the question, why, why do we see this world in such different ways? And in the pursuit of trying to understand it, lucky me, I came across some really great books in neuroscience followed them, added in books in evolutionary biology, cultural anthropology, indigenous philosophy, you know, different ways that humans have organized and made sense out of life over the years. Returning to the world of tech, worked in a couple of companies that were very much about linear pursuit of outcomes, you know, very code-driven, mm. data-driven, mm -hmm. evidence-driven, and deepened and deepened my inquiry into why are these things separate? And what I will add to sort of wrap on that is I have learned as I've looked at increasingly at evolutionary biology, cultural anthropology, indigenous thought ways, contemporary indigenous philosophers, who I think are some of the most brilliant people on the planet right now, and also looked into the world of spirituality, as well as the world of psychedelics. I have come up with a belief, a deep belief that it is really the separation of the powers and qualities of the hemispheres of the mind of the brain that is the driver of so many of the challenges, dysfunctions, and problems we face in the modern world. The polarization we're witnessing, I think, is a manifestation of mm. a pathologically overactive left hemisphere. 
By the way, uh, I have tremendous respect for someone you and I both know. That would be Dr. Ian McGilchrist, a mm -hmm. person with whom I've studied. I am, um, a, I've learned a tremendous amount from his work and have had some quite interesting dialogues with him about the topic. I, I, he's so prominent right now. You know, I only wish that I could have more. And I'm also very much informed by some really interesting work by Harvard neuroanatomist, uh, Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor, whose mm. work also informs. But really at this point, I'm tapping into things that people knew thousands of years ago on, a, on an embodied and intuitive level, simply by living in harmony with the worlds around them, finding ways to survive that are absolutely informing my neuroscience as much as you know, true neuroscience practitioners are. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a wild bio, Ellen, certainly. Um, I forgot one thing. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I'm having a great time. Yeah, good. good. So great. Yeah. Well, you're 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 referencing um a lot of the important pieces, you know, like your your tech experience, your interest in neuroscience, cultural anth cultural anthropology, consciousness, spirituality, indigenous process. You know, like these are all very um powerful threads. Um and and it just sounds like you've been such a seeker for many years. Mm -hmm. Did yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Jill, Jill, of course, I, I interviewed her early on in the process and uh, mm -hmm. fell in love fast. She's uh, <laughs> easy to love. I love that interview. I love that one, by the way. That was, yeah. and I think that, and there are a few that have been my favorites. I guess they can't all be my favorites, <laughs> but I also thought your interview with uh, Bernardo Castro was oh. the best interview. I've never, it's the best interview I've ever heard him give. He is amazing. He's incredible. Well, his book on Jung was very much a... Uh, I, I've been hunting him out for years, so to to get him in when he had written a book on Jung, it was very special. Uh, I'll, hopefully, I'll have him back. Um, well, thank you for that. Um, so, so talk about like just kind of establish this pathway because you've got a great podcast out there, and you're certainly investigating a lot of these subjects. Maybe talk a little bit about what your podcast is, and then we'll dive into our conversation about culture. Thank you. I think the the podcast is really about what I'm about, and that is making neuroscience understandable and usable you know, without, with, with, to anyone who wants to understand yeah. it. I look at the brain as a tool. It's a very, very important tool. We have to remember it's an organ, just like the liver or the pancreas or the spleen is. And we don't spend a lot of time thinking that our liver, our pancreas, our spleen is, you know, in charge of us. Although sometimes in, well, there's a funny thought, but sometimes if, it, if it's, if it's ill, if they're not functioning right, they can be in charge of us. But it's very important to me in my work my work in coaching or in you know leading groups or whatever it is, that people see the brain as their tool rather than have the brain see us as its tool. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the way the brain really works, it's kind of easy to see, especially in a culture that really raises people. I think you know the, the conditioning, the education we get is to much more think about the brain and what the brain can do functionally and usually evidence-based, right or wrong, you know, where you are on that standard deviation or whatever, but really rather than think about the mind and the, the spirit and the will and what, what we really want from all of this. So what brings me great, great satisfaction in my work, John, is when I can work with people to use the brain as a tool that helps them make better sense out of situations that we face in modern life, whether those situations are happening outside of us, such as you know things that are happening in an organization or the workplace. Uh, things that are happening in relationships or in, you know, sort of other sorts of external systems that we navigate mm -hmm. or things that are happening inside of us, which is our own lived experience, our own sense of belonging, mm -hmm. of, um, you know, sort of <laughs> worthiness of being here, which, you know, surprisingly comes up as something that is a really taxing concern for some folks, anxiety and depression. So I don't approach this through a psychological framework as Nobody knows better than you. There's some really good people out there who can do that work. Yet breaking some of these things down so that we understand what is going on in the brain functionally, right? Or even chemically at some times, at some points. This I have found to be really helpful in guiding people to accelerate their quest for more of what they want in their lives. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, well, so dive in there. What do you, I, I think one of the, as I was listening to your podcasts and, and I, I kept having these thoughts about 
these fractals of, you know, looking at the, uh, I was thinking about different areas of the brain as characters in a book, and then how those are extended out into various expressions in our um, interpersonal relationships, but also in our larger collective bodies. And so I, would that be a fair assessment, do you think, of se seeing these kind of fractal patterns that show up that um, that areas of the brain have certain responsibilities, um, and then that's influencing how we set up culture? Because it seems like that's certainly what you're saying by our left hemispheric dominance of the culture at large currently. Well, I would be a little bit pedantic with that. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is that the conditioning of the conditionable parts of the brain, not all of the brain is as conditionable, is conditionable, if you know what I mean, as mm -hmm. others. The, the brain is documenting the experience we have of living a human life. And it's doing that from the time we begin living a human life. Mm -hmm. And it is learning from and adapting itself, pruning itself, or, you know, sort of developing itself to uh, align with those experiences that we are that we have. And then so it's it's you know what, what you said is really interesting because I largely agree with it, but I don't think of the brain as an absolute thing. I think of the brain as the product of sort of three major forces. One is our biology, and a lot of what drives us in life is our biology. Uh, and that would include our genetics, our you know our, our DNA and our RNA and whatever else is going on in there. So genetics and epigenetics. That drives a lot of what our brain is going to be, our predispositions, certain, you know, gosh, there's some people who have sort of outlier functions in their brain that are partially tra traceable to anatomical deviations or mm -hmm. differences might be a better word. Female and male brains with different infusions of hormonal changes during gestation and at different points in their lives that really change certain parts of the brain on really a neurobiological level. So biology is one. And then I would say the other is kind of what I would call environment. You know, I'm 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 here in a very open space. If I were born in this environment, which I was not, I would have a very different sense of what the world is like that would be informing my brain. My brain would be responding to those external influences. Very, but you know, I was born a city girl, and so those were the stimuli that came my way. Mm -hmm. Those at a very early age in my life, both stimulated and kind of took offline or decommissioned certain propensities in my brain. If I were a child born in Tokyo, Japan, it would be a very different story. If I were a child born in Papua New Guinea, it would be a very different story indeed, once again. So biology, environment, and then conditioning, which is largely family system or the influence of close adults or other adults around us. By the age three, the age of three, those three factors have largely given our brain its manifesto for what I need to do, you need to do, anyone needs to do to be a human in these, in these, given these conditions. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is why I don't know if you know, you may about the Kogi people of, I think it's Southern Columbia, who take certain children away and keep them in very isolated areas until as they mature, until they get to adolescence. And the thing that we learn from those people is those children come back with a very different worldview than if they'd been raised with and like mm -hmm. everyone else in their village. That's and those radical. people that infuse their culture with very special and very sacred sorts of capabilities that are not available to others who have lived a more ordinary life. Well, right there, I mean, it's it's um, <laughs> that that's crazy, and I'm I'm sure that there are people that that seems. Um, harmful, you know, given that we are, we're, we're, I don't want to so, so, offer too many generalizations, but there does seem to be this um, desire for a mo more homogenous way of existing and for everybody to be so oriented to these real baseline identity dynamics mm. in culture. And so you mentioned earlier, you know, about female and male brains, and I certainly want to explore these topics that are um, complicated and really triggering to a lot of people. Um, but 
Okay, can I just go in there? Yeah, please go. Yeah, sure. I don't understand this triggering. And in fact, it's it's kind of awkward for me because I am just a few days away from starting a retreat that's for women on the true nature of women on a you know very long lens of our evolution as a species. Uh -huh. So we're dialing it back. We're going back about 440,000 years because that's about all the evidence we have. But we can surmise things from earlier times. And by the way, this was... This was before we were Homo sapiens. I mean, this is earlier mm -hmm. than that. Right. Do you know, John, that almost everyone I've spoken to about this, and certainly almost every man that I've spoken to has gone like, oh my God, I'm so glad I won't be there. That would be so uncomfortable. And it breaks my heart because what this says to me is, first of all, it's like, sorry, that's left hemisphere. We have binaried our way into a situation that I think is very triggering and very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And we are forgetting what the, the only reason we're here is because we're better together. Mm -hmm. And I am a huge fan of the work of Dr. Lila June Johnston. And boy, do I hope she listens to this. I'll send it to her. She is, she is such an inspiration to me, but she speaks so eloquently on the, the concept of two-ness and oneness mm -hmm. and how really we are meant to be better together. And this is Taoist as well. Oh, yeah, you're is, referencing I mean, the, the, you, the yin yang symbol is of course the, absolutely. so is the yeah, cross this, though. I mean, star of David, these are all dual, dual symbols that are in one image. Well, I, yeah, they're, they're everywhere, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. They're everywhere. But in, in the um, indigenous traditions and philosophies that Dr. Lila June references, she talks about mutuality rather than mm. polarity. Mm -hmm. And she uh -huh. talks about the, how the tunis is really about the, we create oneness through tunis that we are mm -hmm. better together. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's really funny. Um, we are having a couple of men come in as our guest speakers to talk about these themes with us. And one of them just, he he said yes. And then yesterday told me, he goes, I just, I, I, I just don't want to do it. <laughs> Because I think so many men feel like they are just, you know, they're just like have they're being attacked. And yeah, that is first of all, if we had been like that way back then, you and I would not be having this conversation. We had to figure out how to negotiate survival together. Right. And I would go so far as to say it in the challenges we are facing now as men and as women. I don't think we've ever had a better invitation to summon the depth of who we really are as humans mm -hmm. to come together to solve problems in a whole new way. And my friend, this extends beyond gender, but gender is a great place to begin. Yeah, it it is. But there, there. I was recently talking to Annie Lamott and her husband uh, Neil mm -hmm. Allen, and Annie was saying she was giving two examples of cancel culture where. Um, she retweeted. I don't. I don't even know the background story other than what I've read from her. But she retweeted a uh, a, a, a transphobic comment like ten years ago and just received enormous backlash. Mm -hmm. And then recently made a comment about Taylor Swift and was similarly backlashed mm -hmm. against. And so I, mm -hmm. I think what, like let's narrativize this a little bit because the the idea that we can. Let me back up. I worked in a school years ago, I think I said this to Annie, I worked in a school years ago, and if what we did when a child made a mistake, or if somebody made a mistake, was we kicked them out of the tribe and made them hide somewhere and go away. You know, you'd have no, there's no, there's no ethic development, there's no, um, there's no uh, recognition of the process of uh, ownership, you know, and apology and forgiveness, and all these inherent process is for cohesive cultural connection. So I'll throw that out there and see what you say, because I know that's a hot topic. I, I couldn't, I want to just break into applause because I couldn't agree more. And what's also missing from this and through your work, I know you understand it, just really what is underlying that? What are the drivers of those behaviors or those mm. thoughts, right? And that is really where there's some systemic, I think really some systemic pain. Mm -hmm. I have a belief that, you know, Western culture, I'm, I'm not alone in this belief, and it's certainly not an original belief, but Western culture, when it arose about, you know, 3,000, 3,500 years ago, was a cancel culture against the feminine. And I, I think there's pretty good substantiation <laughs> through that. <laughs> That's good. 
Yeah. Yeah. It was about yeah. 300 year cancel culture. Wow. You know, I could show my slides from this retreat that I'm about to do, but it shows quotes from some of the names that we turn to the most. Not all of the names, but many of the names we turn to the most. Name a few. What's that? Name a few. Aristotle. Yeah. Uh, Plato. Uh, yeah. You can name us. I mean, I don't want to blame you. It yeah. seemed like a good idea at the time, didn't it? Yeah. And if we look at what happened in the few hundred years before that, there were some pretty serious things. So there were very right. highly functional, flourishing, and innovative Neolithic cultures that appear to be very egalitarian mm -hmm. on a number of vectors, not only gender egalitarian, but very much about, you know, uh, different socioeconomic balance, about mm -hmm. real Basically, when you look at the art from this time, it looks like sort of proto Burning Man, like people were having a really good time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even the burial sites are cool, you know? Yeah. But the art is amazing. Well, then, you know, enter, boom, volcanic eruptions, you know, ensuing tidal waves, earthquakes, and things that went on for a really long time. Marauders came down from the north to that flourishing, flourishing area, really the, the cradle of Western civilization and started pillaging. You know, we see the first mass, you know, what do you call them? like really bad things, mass burials, and you see, mm -hmm. you know, metal that had been used for agricultural tools and uh, certain other sort of more householdy water systems, things like this now being used for spears and very important sword, right? Protection. I mean, uh, what do you call this? Uh, shields. shields. Yeah, mm -hmm. that. You see all of the changes in the way that technologies of the time mm. were used because people began to war and conflict. And there were certain groups of people that said this all happened because nature reared her too powerful head. We can conquer nature through the, the life of the, the mind. And we hear this then in writing that, you know, was written very shortly after that, thou shalt have dominion over the earth mm. and all of its creatures. I think there were a lot of experiments in the ways humans lived over the, the, the many, many, you know, tens and longer thousands of years. But what rose at that time is very different than what rises or what rose in the societies still living on this planet who have been here for 100,000 years, the San people, the people of the, the Kalahari uh, Desert, 30,000 years, people in different parts of Central uh, and and Eastern Africa, 40 or some say 60,000 years, including an ice age, Aboriginal, Australian, mm -hmm. Indigenous Australian people, many, many other people who have held their societies intact and held the cultures intact. They never separated like we separated at that time. In fact, there are three things that really seem to mark them. There are more, but three are really interesting to me right now. One is non-duality with natural systems. And that means living as part of the natural world, mm -hmm. not apart from the natural world. There's a very interesting Peruvian teacher, Arkan Mushwala, who says, you know, living in human supremacy has never been part of indigenous cosmology. Wow. Yeah. So part of, not apart from, non-duality with the natural world. Next, long-term thinking. Oh, what's that? Well, that's when you remember everything you've learned from the ancestors, and then you make decisions considering the futures mm. and fortunes of others who you will never even meet. Many people would look at this as like a seven generation sort of thing or so yeah. forth. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. Many yeah. manifestations of it. And then the third is what I call gender mutuality, that we're better together. And in fact, in many of these cultures, there isn't the same sort of gender binary that we live here. You know, just listening to some really interesting things the other day about uh, groups. I'm certain I've read a lot of Margaret Mead's work on, you know, sex and gender. Very, very interesting models that she brought back. But it, it seems that there are, you know, in, in, in some cultures, there are three, four, or five separately acknowledged and identified genders that are part of both your biological configuration and maybe some sort of a, who knows what, spiritual assignment or such. There are groups of people that do not give their children a gender specific name until after their sixth birthday or sometimes a little bit later. And um, yeah, there are others that, I mean, it was very interesting looking at this linguistically as well, that there are some languages, I think East African, and I hope I'm not getting this wrong, but I think it was a, a it was Yoruba, where there aren't even the sorts of ways of identifying gender that we construct in the Western world. Like there, there isn't like even a, 
sister or brother word. It's more like, this is my relative whose body is like this. This is my relative whose body is like that. And it's not even the topic of discussion that creates the division we have in this world. Mm. Isn't it interesting, John? It's totally I interesting. Love stuff. Your blood, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. I've got like 14 questions that just came up from what you're talking about. But <laughs> um, I want to I want to return because you started talking about the the differences in the male and the female brain, yeah. and 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 it's tough because, like, what I I notice that I have trouble sometimes even talking about this. Of course, there's an anxiety about uh, offending people and how where are they coming yes. from and you know, like I, I, I come at this with an open heart. I, I also just want to be able to have the conversation. And my oh, wife and I are talking about this a lot. Like yeah. one of the toughest aspects of this period of time is that there are conversations like Voldemort that shall not be spoken about. And it's very difficult to then come mm-hmm. to understand, like I'm an external processor, so I got to think this stuff out loud. And if I can't talk about it, then I can't come to know it. I certainly can't let you reflect on what I'm saying. So I want to dive into female male brain and all the things that you will probably get it. us canceled. Yeah. So here's what I want to say is let's just have fun with this. Yeah, good. Because that's what we're forgetting in all of this, isn't it? Oh, uh, like, amen. When yes. you really <laughs> look at it, it's like, I mean, what, first of all, we could go on all day about like what it, what we think it might mean to be human, what this journey is really about and so forth. Yeah. But I think we have to remember, this is all about love, you know, Amen. Yeah. like what else is it for? Like if we have been given this gift of life, do we do it so we could like hate on each other and stuff like that? I no. Hope not. So I'm going to go all oponopono on you, my friend, <laughs> not that one, right? Yes. Let's just say it like. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I forgive you. Please forgive me. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. Yeah. Like there is so much. I love the duality of that. Mm-hmm. I love that it's vast and confusing and doesn't even make sense. Right. But with that in mind, we kind of have to go to a place that is about not knowing. I don't know anything I'm talking about, really. Mm-hmm. I've used science and inquiry and art and all sorts of things to, to formulate and fabricate a belief system mm-hmm. that really has been generous to me and has given me many good things in my life. But let's try to pin down something I'm right about. I mean, mm-hmm. I you could say, well, you're a woman with white hair. And then, you know, Donald Hoffman could come by and say, well, actually, they're just some vibrating subatomic particles that kind of <laughs> activate your optic nerves. I think I've got his book right there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's the best. Yeah. Yeah. He's so good. Yeah. So let's just play with it, John. Yeah. Good. Wait, unless, do you mean offense? Do you mean to offend anybody with anything Mm, you're going to say? Not in the slightest. Oh, good. Because me either. And by the way, if I make a mistake, I beg of anyone listening, help me get better by helping me in a way I can learn from. Please. You know, I had this conversation with my daughter the other day where she's she said, she said to me, daddy, is shit a bad word? And I said, I said, well, no, I don't, I don't necessarily believe there are bad words. I I think the only words that are bad, if we can use that framework, are words that are used to hurt other people and be critical of other people and be mean. And so it, it was really a, a wonderful, liberating conversation that I do think it matters. I, I do think your reminder of fun matters. And so, yes, I'm in. Let's have some fun. Good. So let's just begin where you're really wanting to go here, yeah. male person. You're asking, are men smarter than women, aren't you? <laughs> not, not even in the slightest. <laughs> I'm joking. You know I'm joking. Yes. Yeah. It's, I've been reading a lot about this lately, and I just, I have to say, I snicker all the time. Good. Tricks is definitely at play in Good. the male brain, female brain conversation. Say more about what you mean by that. I'm going to come back to kind of what I said before, complementary and mutual. There are different types of intelligence that your brain and my brain can process at any given time. Your hormones in your brain and my hormones in my brain, they match. We have the same hormones. Mm -hmm. However, the areas of the brain that are going to activate are going to be kind of based on usage patterns Mm -hmm. and also on some anatomical and I guess you would say physiological biological differences in our uh in our in 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 our neurohormones so estrogen is a really interesting one 
Um, estrogen, there's some, gosh, it'd be so neat to show you some of the, the, the images that I've been looking at lately, but it, it basically, I'd say the shorthand is that female brains have more connections is kind of the latest theory that we are able to access more from different parts of the brain and maybe other parts of the being. Mm -hmm. Male brains are more efficient. They get there faster. Mm -hmm. You know, John, I want to tell you a really great story that comes from, I think from the Kalahari in the early 60s. There was a young woman who went down with her parents who were, you know, like so many at the time, missionaries, right? Mm -hmm. And um, who grew up with, I believe, the San people. The book, for anyone who's interested, is called The Old Ways. And I can share the attribution because it's really neat. But um, these people and the way they lived became very interesting, as did the, the Zuni people. In fact, there was a really great joke that I read in a book about Zuni culture. And it said that, you know, describe a typical Zuni family. And Zuni are a, a really beautiful Native American uh, group and culture from in, who live now in the New Mexico, what we call the New Mexico reason. It said the typical Zuni family is, you know, two parents, two or three children, and an anthropologist. <laughs> yeah yeah because they've Please. also studied for very Teach similar yeah. but anyway all of these people flew in from harvard to visit these folks in the kalahari and they brought all their rochart tests and mazes and all of these psychological tests and the the write-up of this from the 60s and written in such an innocent way is all the men could look at the the mazes and go and just figure them out like this. And the women would look at the mazes and basically go toss, you know, just <laughs> like throw them over their shoulder. And so, of course, all of these psychologists are like, oh, well, they're, you know, male brain, more intelligent brain, you know. Here's what people in the sciences forget mm. science values their own, its own type of intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Dr. Allison Gopnik, one of my absolute favorite, mm. you know, luminaries and early childhood uh, development expert and psychologist and really key person in, in sort of everything about the child mind at UC Berkeley, amazing person. But she talks about the fact that most psychological studies are going to be taken from the position of that PhD person in a lab coat who probably has certain types of attributes that, you know, I won't bother to name right. here, but right. you could generalize and say, especially a number of years ago, comparing the child's brain or the teenage brain to their own brain as if it's a prototype that will eventually reach their state of mind, if they're mm -hmm. really lucky, but is inherently inferior to it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that took us a little bit off of the path that you had started about the female and male, male brain. But oh, what I loved yeah. about these early studies were men were largely hunters and trekkers. And hunting is very important in all human society or all, you know, early human societies, because women, just because of our reproductive systems, the way our bodies work in, in its own reproductive technology, need iron and, you know, protein. I mean, obviously, we mm -hmm. women need iron because of because we bleed. It's mm -hmm. we lose a lot of it through that process. And so men had developed over time this really amazing intelligence and I'm sure it's nature nurture, right? Everything's nature nurture, but they, their brains were really optimized for solving linear problems, going out and finding what they were looking for and bringing it back. Women were much more about, Hey, the collective, how does this all fit together? Mm -hmm. What is the longer term? Um, what is the longer term uh, bigger picture context of this, and I, I have in my slide deck for my retreat, social intelligence is a survival technology. We could have never survived without that intelligence. And so one of the other studies that I read looked at the percentages, this is very interesting research, but of how many calories and how much nutrition was coming from hunters and how much was coming from the gatherers, right? And it's about a about twenty percent of the nutrition is from hunting, and about eighty percent is coming from the gathering. Hmm. And that really works. Yeah. And by the way, in different seasons of the year in hunter gatherer societies, 
men are helping with the gathering because mm -hmm. when it's time to gather, you gather, right? And if I can show you pictures from so many places in the world. Women also hunted. It was a different type of hunting. It was a much more local type of hunting. It wasn't going out and getting the big game. Mm -hmm. And John, we could go down such a rabbit hole about how that collaborative hunting of men developed as a result of the emerging and more collaborative prefrontal cortex, which the latest thinking that I am following, we don't know anything about this, they're just theories, but was because men and women had to learn to work together in different ways than any prior primate had had to work together because our bodies became so vulnerable in childbirth mm -hmm. because we were bipedal, right? We were walking on two feet that men had to really, we, we learned, we're smart beings. We learned that we were risking our life in reproducing. And so different types of protective and mutual relationships had to emerge in order for us to be willing to take the risk to reproduce. And you may say, many would say, well, but how would they know? You know, in you, we both know and love Adele Getty. Mm -hmm. Adele has written a beautiful book called Goddess, right? Goddess, Goddess or Goddesses. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing it right. Is that her forthcoming God book? Is that coming out soon? Oh, no, it's her. She wrote it years ago. She did. It's I've incredible. got her sacred spaces at home. Oh, yeah. yeah. She's amazing. Yeah. But Adele wrote this book and it shows a woman from, I think it's 24,000 years ago. She's holding a crescent moon and inscribed, it's a horn, but the horn is a symbol for the moon and inscribed in it are 13 incisions dividing it into 14 spaces, mm -hmm. which is the shape of the moon. If all women are cycling together, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is the shape of the moon at the time that women ovulate. Mm -hmm. you know. So radical. It's so, so cool, isn't it? So you're talking about uh, what I, I really like this thread you started by saying that cancel culture, there is an active cancel culture of the feminine mm -hmm. and the female. And uh, I, I, like, let's pick that up and start looking at the ways in which, because there, there are many who would say, yeah, look, you know, we've, we've had a lot of innovation and um, there's been a lot of advances as a result of linear thinking and oh, yes. you know, quantitative analysis and machine, you know, machines and machine learning, so on and so forth. So uh, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I do want to find out what you believe that is sacrificed in that process of a kind of more... Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, you know, linear and dominance oriented approach yeah. to nature. You're right. It is, it is the dominator approach. And yeah. it's a funny thing because the word dominator has several meanings. And one of them is really about domicile. Like mm. the, it's a really interesting thing that they, they uh, somewhere along the line share some sort of a common root. Mm. root. Um, I am not advocating for anything but balance, balance in the brain, balance in our mutuality, balance in the systems. And I, I mentioned earlier in our conversation, John, that I think some of the most brilliant thinkers on the planet right now are people who are kind of melding um, indigenous knowledge mm -hmm. systems with sort of contemporary reality and coming up with some very interesting emergent ways of thinking. And that it, it's a funny thing because we are talking about better together, the sort of better together how can the past make the future better? How can the future heal, you know, some of the, the situations that we're all in right now? Voices, some amazing people like Tyson Yukoporta, mm. um, Australian, really brilliant thought leader. And um, there's a bio, and I, I don't want to even say his name because I, I don't quite have the pronunciation down. But these are people who are really looking at how the melding of ancient knowledge systems and indigenous thought ways with contemporary sciences and you know all of these things that we have learned and accomplished through the western mind which mm -hmm. has given us many gifts you know but we will come back to the what has been counseled also um and how that can create an emergent way of living that actually is something of an evolution of consciousness in a, in a really inspiring way mm -hmm. again it's it's sort of the ultimate better together isn't it yeah, I mean, it, it it really is this. Uh, we are in a fascinating phase of reclamation with 
um, different modes of existing. And certainly the word indigenous is used quite often for us yeah. to, to tend to uh, reclaim what was lost. And, yeah. this, and this is like what, I mean, what a lot of those leaders, you know, people that I think of Mircea Eliade or Joseph Campbell or Cole Jung, of course, you know, that there's a, there's a need for a new myth, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and it makes sense to look at more animistic nature centered traditions mm. in order to kind of discover um, the mythos yeah. that um because yeah. so, so much of our modern mythology is is like it, it takes us out in a way of from the direct experience of a natural ex it, it, of nature it, yes it doesn't i almost feel like a new myth is calling us forth i mean if we really want to go all animistic on it you know i if we can look at yin and yang and say well of course things are going to balance and Gosh, John, if I had a nickel for everyone who's told me even in the last six months, like, oh, we humans, we're done for, we're going to be gone. And da, 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 da. Mm, I don't think that's what it's, I think we're being called forward. I really yeah, do. I, I do too. I'm, asked, I'm of course hopeful, but yeah, I believe that too. Yeah. You asked a question. I don't want to, I don't want to avoid it. You asked about the cancel culture. I still got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Can I go there now? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, please, please jump oh, in. Cool. So what I want to talk about is, you know, let's let's not try to wind back to the 3,500 years, but even to more recent history, a couple hundred years ago, several hundred years ago, that we all kind of know about. And that is that there was a time in Western history, European history, when um, women who had sort of special qualities of, you know, feeling things, sensing things, being able to know how to use plants for medicine and mm -hmm. so forth, stuff that couldn't be evidenced through a scientific process. Mm -hmm. They all shared something in common, or many of them shared something in common, and that is they got to feel what fire felt like. They got mm -hmm. burned at the stake. They mm -hmm. were witches. Yeah. You know, when I was doing research for this, I read a story that, or a, a, an account that was about a, a woman who had been later named a holy woman. I don't think she was a saint, but she had been put into a cell because she was a witch. And when the judge went to see her in the cell, and I'm probably getting a lot of this wrong, but not too much of it. The judge went to see her in the cell, said, you know, my lady, prove to me that you are a, a witch. Or I see, oh, no, no. He said, I see you are a witch because you, once I stepped into this cell with you, you summoned a cat and a dog and a goat and a crow and a this, you are a witch and you will be burned at the stake. And I'm like, but yeah, I don't know that she summoned him. He saw them. Shouldn't he be the witch who gets anyway? Yes. But it it was, there was a time when those principles were kind of deselected mm -hmm. from our gene pool, our cultural pool. And these attributes turn out to be attributes that I think the world is largely longing for right now and that are really calling us back. Do you know what I'm saying? Totally. Like, I think in our hearts and maybe even in our bodies, we are really wanting, many of us are wanting more balance, yet the polarity has become so vast that so we have no idea how to go find it again. And it, it is, there's sort of a sunk cost fallacy there that's like, mm. well, it's not working, but maybe if I keep doing it, it will keep working. But this has hurt all of us, in my opinion. Yeah. It's really hurt all of us. And when... Um, when we look at the way people are treating each other, the pe way that people are prioritizing decisions and actions in the world, the amount of war and strife that exists, and the amount of trauma that so many individuals carry in their bodies, their spirits, their minds, their hearts, right? And in their systems. And trauma perpetuates trauma, right? Mm -hmm. What else can it do? Two really interesting things come to mind. One is, I think, in Western culture, the dis the alienation of the female, what was feminine, our disassociation with what was feminine um, is kind of the trauma beneath all traumas. You know, Richard Rohr spoke about this on one of mm -hmm. your podcasts when mm -hmm. he spoke about that there's no, in a way that, that, that war compounding upon war, compounding upon war, what this has done to injure men. Well, we can trace war back to, you know, in our culture, something that really seemed to emerge in the Western lineage about 3,500 or 4,000 years ago. Certainly in other, there was war, there were wars before that. And then the other thing we have to say is in more balanced cultures and the cultures for their gender mutuality, there is an acknowledgement that trauma is part of human experience. And that, that acknowledgement is addressed through rituals 
and many of them are extremely sophisticated that are specifically designed to activate and release traumatic experiences mm -hmm. so that they don't accrue to others. They don't get passed down to future generations. They don't get relived in active situations where we're traumatizing others and so forth. And I think those two reality, like the, the sort of those two vectors, the really the initial trauma of the invalidation, the loss, the dissociation to some, some might even say the repudiation of all things feminine. And by the way, John, I want to give you some big old thanks right now, because if I, I wouldn't have had the courage to talk about this shit 10 years ago. Mm. Do you know how many times like talking like this, I got called woo woo? Seriously. Mm. So the times are changing and pardon my French, but, but then also the, the proactive acknowledgement and release of trauma has made long surviving human cultures much more healthy and sustainable. It's certainly hopeful. Yeah, that resonates. Um, I'm still struck by this. I, I'm still struck by this image that you have of the judge. And I've read the Inquisition documents and some of the early um, witch trials, both in Europe and the United States. And I, it does seem so absurd to burn somebody uh, God, that takes a lot of hate. Honey, I got to tell you, let's love that guy up and have empathy for him. If we're going <laughs> to talk it, let's do it. So let me talk about it. Here was a boy who was probably raised by a mother who feared her feminine so much. She mm -hmm. wanted to completely crush any indication of it out of it. He enters the world of men in a hierarchical and dominating system. The only way that he is going to be validated for a man as a man is by being one of those men. Mm -hmm. And the only way he's going to win as a man is by being better at it, stronger at it, fiercer at it, more decisive at it, more binary at it, at it than the guy in the office down the hall. Not that there was probably an office down a hall. So he too, like you, like me, like everyone, was simply the product of his biology, his environment and his conditioning, his causes and conditions, as you know, Buddhist wisdom would say. So he was in a position where he was absolutely convinced based on those factors that he was right, right enough to say, we must eliminate this from the gene pool because this cannot go forward. This is not the way of hierarchy, domination, God, whatever you will. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, if I saw that guy, I'd probably want to I'll just be real nice about it, throw a pie in his face, right? <laughs> or do something. But we have to understand psychologically, he was the product of causes and conditions, just like every one of us is. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a good reminder not to uh, not to cancel, you know. Not to cancel. Yeah. Not to cancel. Yeah, to sit, to sit with something. the struggle. And sit with it and also be curious. Mm-hmm. I'm touching my prefrontal cortex for those that are listening, right? The front of my brain. Curiosity. This is how we learn. I, that's a whole other thing. But do you know that there is a culture, and I don't know where it is, and there may well be more than one such culture, but I do know there is one culture in Western Africa. I don't remember exactly which group it is. But when someone does something to harm the community, rather than castigate or remove or, or you know, get rid or cancel that person, they bring that person back and they basically tell them all of the beautiful and good things they've done in that village, in that community since they were a little child. Mm. And they don't stop until the person cracks on open, breaks down, and comes back to their true self. Mm. And in that, from what I have read in those cultures, recidivism is not a thing. I can People imagine. don't repeat crimes. Yeah, in our culture, we isolate and shame people, and then we don't give them the opportunity to ever find it in themselves. It's really sad. It's really yeah. something. This isn't... is one of my favorites, by the way. You just got a little gift of the feminine. Oh, my... this is so yeah. Tell me about it. But it's a piece that um, actually came on the other day with a, a patient of mine that I was 
we were talking about the feminine and ancestors and in the middle of talking about a dream about the feminine and ancestors this this painting came on and it's this beautiful image of the feminine in nature with skulls oh, and so wow. the yeah but i i just wow that's do you know what's a- cracking me up right now because <laughs> there's like a little bit of serendipity happening here <laughs> So check out, you know, go back to how you were because it yeah. was it's pretty great. Look what's on the other side, my picture, the bull. Yes. And that also it's a bull with this a longhorn. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's one who lives on this 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 ranch that I'm visiting right now, and his name is Diego. And that little black thing to the side is a flying saucer. And what I'm finding really huh. funny is very right hemispheric huh. image above mm-hmm. you, very left hemispheric image above me, showing balance, mm-hmm. better together. I don't know. <laughs> I'm feeling it. Right on. I do too. Um, no coincidences. No coincidences. Yes. God, I said that I was doing a, an, an interview with a fellow the other day where something really radical happened. And he said at the end of it, he was like, John, there are no coincidences. And I was reminded of this um, reference to the Ionians. And uh, a teacher of mine at one point said that the Ionians didn't have a word for the concepts of accident or coincidence. And so in this kind of idea that we're talking about, we started before we started recording, you were talking about how language matters. And mm-hmm. in fact, we were talking about the idea of penetrating sex mm-hmm. and how, what a misnomer that is, because mm-hmm. it, it gives su- such agency to the to the male bodied person. Um, and then this kind of receptivity, the female bodied person, and it and it squashes our ideal of the of the image of the togetherness of mutuality. Yeah. It's so yeah. funny. Um, can I reference a book I just finished reading? Totally. Yeah, go. This book is so good. It's called, it has a wild name. It's called Word Slut. Yep, you heard it. <laughs> nice. Mm-hmm. And you and I had spoken about the the whole idea of, you know, the male penetrates the woman. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and, but this young author, Amanda, and I'm, I'm forgetting, I don't know the pronunciation of her last name. I'm happy to share it for show notes, but this book is a hysterically funny book about how language informs identity. And she actually, I, when I heard it, I was listening, she reads it on an audible version and she started talking about the word penetration. I'm like, ding, 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 you know, cause I thought, oh, this is like the conversation with John. And she um, she really goes into how how powerful that word is for dividing and dis mm-hmm. equal like removing mm-hmm. equilibrium and mutuality mm-hmm. from that relationship. And by the way, you know, it's, I don't blame anybody for sort of seeing things that way given the fact that most of us grew up on images of like cavemen dragging women back to the cave by their hair and so forth. And by the way, I can't go here without giving deep, deep honor to one of my most profound teachers. And that is a brilliant social scientist and futurist named Rain Eisler, Mm -hmm. who wrote the book, The Chalice and the Blade, which I had the great gift of, you know, coming across 15 years ago and actually reading because it's a, it's a pretty intense, pretty academic read, mm-hmm. but that really gets down to the psychology beneath and the, the social impact of the, of the shift from partnership with each other and mutuality with each other and into hierarchical and dominator mm-hmm. structures. It's, a, mm-hmm. it's one of the books that my wife has been urging me to read for some time the chalice and the blade and uh um, the 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 alphabet and the goddess are the two that oh that's really that was one of my gateways for sure she's she's reading uh, she's reading the work that you uh, the book that you recommended that i haven't been able to read yet bitch which uh, again is more of this great stuff you know (laughs) it's so great and let's hear it for lucy cook and i don't can i yeah she talks about it she's writing another book now guess what it's called what cock Ah, nice. Good. About the mail. Good. Yeah. Good. She is so, I mean, imagine a National Geographic explorer, a zoologist, a brilliant protege of Richard Dawkins, and the stand up comic. What could possibly go wrong? So She's the greatest. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, well, this is the stuff that I really want to continue get, to get into, which is this, I think, the larger kind of unifying dimension of the language we're using around togetherness and mutuality and connection, but also really hitting at the problems of the polarization that we're having, which is registering on Mm -hmm. identity of race, of religion, 
of gender politics, politics, you know, like this science, this you name flip. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you you tend to say, well, two things. I'll I'll load this up a little bit. Um, yeah, two things you've talked about, which are um, triggers. We we talked about triggers earlier, and of course, your reference to the amygdala amygdala response, and right. looking at cancel culture through the lens of. Uh, dysregulated individuals who haven't had the ability to really navigate through their own um, systems and be conscious of what's happening in their hurt. So they project it out. Roar, te- Roar does a great job of saying that we we, tra- we transmit what we don't transform. And so yeah. looking at the issues collectively around our cancel, cancel policy that we're having right now in our social spaces, and also this um, female male dynamic, I just want to continue to really go at this and see what else you have to say, because I know you're sure, teaching sure. on it. Yeah. Hmm. Should I, I just I, go on? I, yeah, I don't. I, I realize that I'm not like necessarily having a question there. I just, I have such curiosity um, about, about all these associations that you're making with this. Yeah, I have a lot of curiosity about them too, apparently. But you know, what came up though for me as I was listening to you is how did those things start? Mm-hmm. And the only answer that I have is little by little. Mm-hmm. Like so many things in human experience are contagious, right? We're all interacting, we're all responding, we're looking at others as as models. And by the way, we learn that at a very early age. Mm -hmm. I believe we learn to become human by imitating the adults around us, the role models around us. So how did it start little by little? Okay. How might it end little by little? And this, I think, is the great invitation of this time. And the good news is is that there's so many amazing people out there offering their voices, um, offering their service to try to reclaim this most precious thing that we have, which I think is our mutuality. Um, And I don't know what the tipping point is. Or It's so funny. A a client of mine recently asked me, like, why should I even bother, Ellen? I, I, I just think all is lost, right? I... I see the writing on this person who's a pretty prominent scientist, Mm -hmm. climate scientist. I see the writing on the wall. I see it. It's nothing can make this better. We've already gone too far. And the only thing that I can come up with, John, and this isn't really answering your question, but we can come back and we can try to. to I have a better question. I actually have a question this time. So, yeah. (laughs) Okay, that's great. But what I want to say is I have no idea if any of this is going to help or not, right? Uh, Who knows if we're going to fix it, we're going to solve it, we're going to get through it, we're going to get whatever else. I do believe we are part of something larger than we can possibly understand. That is my belief. It doesn't mean I'm right. Mm -hmm. I know I've had moments where I didn't believe that. I have dear friends who see it very differently than I do. However, I find a tremendous amount of courage, comfort, inspiration, and meaning in believing that this is part of something much larger than I can understand. And all that really matters is is is, is how I play the game and why mm-hmm. I play the game. What mm-hmm. I do might mm-hmm. matter less than my determination mm-hmm. to do it with values that really, you know, seem to live in my heart, values of of love, values of care for others, values of, you know, as we said earlier, no coincidences, you know, whether they have been challenges to me or gifts to me in my life, who's to say, but all of them have made me who I am and have given me the gift of this life and this experience. And I'm not saying that in some happy, happy, joy, joy way. I've really come to deeply believe it. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is an extreme call right now for us all to show up aligned with those values that mean the most to us. I have two people in my life who are quite close to me through, uh, through relationships, through connections that weave us together, whose ideologies are, I don't even, those aren't the right words, but who I'm sure vote extremely differently from how I vote, who have certain ways of being that are very different. When I sit with these people and we get beneath those things that many people would say we should divide us, we are people who share some really, really good values that we're expressing in different ways. And I've really valued what I've learned from them and, you know, hope that I've shown up authentically enough to offer how, what I believe in ways that maybe soften 
some of the polarities that might divide us otherwise. And by the way, I can't say those words without crediting yet another great book and great author. And that book is called I Never Thought of It That Way by the brilliant Monica Guzman, who wrote a book about over... Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. She's she's on my podcast too. Yeah. She's a, yeah. a person I know well and really deeply value and respect. Mm -hmm. But it's about navigating these very difficult conversations through curiosity and care. Well, and that gets at the the core of the lobbed ball that didn't really have a question earlier, which is if we think about our our canceling, you know, what's happening when we encounter difference, you know, because because if we could frame this in by saying, and let me provide an example, I read recently that it's in one study. Who knows where this comes from? But uh, in one study, I don't have the reference now, 83% of all Republicans think Democrats are lunatics and 79% of all Democrats think Republicans are all insane. It's, you know, you get the gist. So so there's something triggering, right? And that's what is is filling our cancel culture and we can fall into our silos. I, I, want, I want you to talk a little bit about when we talk about triggers, what's happening? Because you did a whole entire podcast on amygdala hijack. And and then it seems like one of the things that you would say, I imagine, is a value of yours is to use curiosity as a kind of inoculator against yeah. being overwhelmed. So talk about that for a bit. Yeah, that's great. You know, the prefrontal cortex is our friend, this highly human part of the brain that, um, you know, it's so funny sometimes with audiences, I have people like hug their prefrontal cortex. And when I do that in Texas, I have them wiggle the horns yeah. here and I have some really good, yeah, there you go. We got to <laughs> hug this thing too. It's the front of our brain. It's the most, um, it's the most, the newest part of our brain, evolutionarily speaking. And it is the home of many wonderful things, um, new and novel thought, intentional thinking, on the other hand, thinking, and a whole other conversation. But the left and the right prefrontal cortex are actually quite different from each other. And boy, oh boy, do they like the whole brain. They work really well together. They're meant to be a, they're meant to be a team. When we experience threat, and I'm going to talk first about like sort of, you know, sort of time bound threat, like that there is actually a specific moment of threat. For example, suddenly the uh, saber tooth tiger appears at the window, you know, six feet from me. A chemical process fire signal is received by my body, and by my brain, and a reaction fires in my brain that is often referred to as the amygdala hijack. And this is a chemical mm. reaction that that floods the brain and also the body with um, chemicals that create feelings we're all familiar with. We might feel a clenching in the gut, you know, that feeling. We might feel, I think people often call it chicken skin or pins and needles, mm -hmm. which is amazing. That's blood being sucked away from the skin, which is the body's largest organ and being diverted into, and from small mm. muscle groups, being diverted into large muscle groups. You know, all the things that would allow us to fight or flee uh, in the fight or flight response. But it's also vasoconstricting, meaning reducing blood flow to the prefrontal cortex, which means that uh, the PFC is not receiving its usual fuel supply of um oxygen, glucose, lipids, things like that. And what's amazing about that is that, there are a lot of things that are amazing about that, but it's taking that higher cognition, that higher intentionality offline. And um, the hippocampus is the lovely little part of the brain. Uh, its name is so funny. Hippocampus means seahorse. I mean, they say it looks like a seahorse. I've looked at these things. They don't look anything like a seahorse to me, but call it what you will, right? But the hippocampus is the, or the hippocampi, because we each have two, is the part of the brain that starts to provide a response that can help sort of calm that down, right? That's kind of take that hijack offline. And as you know, John, the hippocampus is also the part of the brain. It's very largely associated. It's all part of this, the, the, the limbic system, but it's very much a source associated with memories mm -hmm. and with sort of personal narratives of who we are. So you can really see how these things of fear and correction, fear and correction can really form the brain story of what it takes to keep us alive. Um, a very interesting thing 
and this is why I wanted to mention incidental trauma versus more or incidental threat versus long-term threat. And this is a, a thing that I, I, I actually would love to spend more time learning about in the future. In long-term threat, there seems to be some evidence that people who are really repetitively and consistently exposed to even lower levels of threat, like not saber-toothed tiger, tiger version of threat, but maybe more like a uh, mouse runs in the house type of threat, you know, something mm. dangerous. And mind you, it's important to say that the brain does not really have the ability to differentiate between threats to survival from threats to the ego or identity or opinion, even to some extent. Mm. But in these people who have the lower level of ambient threats, there seems to be something that the hippocampus is kind of calibrating itself to that. Um, and I, I like to use the words, no, I hate to use the words, but I use the words kind of giving up and not coming back and correcting these stress states. So let's think about the last few years, shall we? Right? Because neuroscience. And I don't have evidence. I've seen conflicting research on whether the hippocampus can is recoverable. I believe it is, but there's mixed. I'm not in a position to say it is or it isn't. There are circumstances where the hippocampus is re, like it can start to recalibrate and return to sort of its original and intended function. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the amygdala hijack takes higher cognition offline. And the two best things that I've seen for bringing it back online are available to all of us. One of them I just did without even really meaning to. I took a breath. Mm -hmm. Take a breath. And it's just, it's just, it's just so obvious. If if the if vasoconstriction is eliminating is limiting the flow of oxygen to the prefrontal cortex, well then breath is a good way to bring it back. So very often in my coaching work or in my teaching or you know workshops and stuff, I'll actually have people really learn to take a breath before re react before responding a breath one breath one second one heartbeat one breath intentional breath can be the difference between a triggered reaction largely driven from the faster cognition of the left hemisphere to a slower by a nanosecond reaction that reflects more of the on the other hand thinking of a balanced brain mm -hmm. and i can't talk about fight or flight without talking about a recent study where a neuroscientist went back to get a deeper understanding of the research that was done on the fight or flight um, response reaction many decades ago and found that all of the subjects, and this is not uncommon in medicine, but all of the subjects of that were men. Mm -hmm. And this neuroscientist yeah. went back and re-ran the experiment with all females and came up with a very, very different type of response it really speaks to that estrogen and that connectivity and also think about the mutuality when i tell you this but it's they they called it tend and befriend i've mm -hmm. changed it mm -hmm. i called it tend befriend defend we've all seen a mama bear mm -hmm. and then this one makes me sad pretend no no it's fine everything's good right so we have fight flight and all the other f words that come out of that and there's some right. good ones being primarily associated with androgen hormones. And mm -hmm. then we have the 10, like look at the context. Yeah, John, can mm -hmm. you see how well those two approaches could fit together if we let them? Uh, yes. Uh, that's what I was just thinking about actually, um, how how sad it is. Um, uh, yeah, how othering. But I like mm -hmm. I like the concept, you know, you introduced the idea, the word of threat, and I think that's important. And so like that, when that thing is happening in the body, there's a perceived threat. And so I, I think certainly as a man, I'm thinking about, huh? <laughs> Balloons going up in the air? Uh, thank you. Let's hear it for AI while we're at it, right? I mean, come on. It's magic. Yeah, it's total it's magic. magic. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think about the... Um, the the dynamics when I, I certainly feel threatened and whether it's happening in you know um, uh, with my children you know like if there's something happening in their world um, in a conflict with my wife you know and what goes on something with business you know like all the various areas of perceived threat and all the layers upon which you know levels upon which that happens and then the ways it happens in my body and to so to contextualize it go. Look at the intelligence in your body. I see. I love. I love. <laughs> what a great reframe. Yes. 
Yeah. Okay, what so about listen it? Go. Up. Yeah. What if you were taught, hey, you know that weird feeling you get? That's an intelligence. How do you want to use your intelligence now? Yeah. So you feel threat. Now, by the way, saber tooth, I'm gonna scream and run. Yes. Grab whatever, grab stick and hit it, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever, whatever. I'm gonna fight. Know how to fight. Yes. Right. I'm not going to go, hey, maybe it's already eaten. You know, mm -hmm. it's just there's that thing that is a survival reaction. Yet at this time and place, when we feel threat in our body, we feel that constriction, that's intelligence. Mm -hmm. And we can take a moment and go like, okay, what, what do I know right now that might even be precognitive? What do I know without knowing? And I, I cannot imagine a situation in any of the things you described we're taking one breath wouldn't give us access to a more balanced way of looking at that. And even then asking a question, I mean, something as reflexive and trainable as saying, right? Say more about that. Tell me more. Mm -hmm. Now you've been trained to do this in your profession is mm -hmm. that by holding presence and going into inquiry, you can come to things that wouldn't be available through any other way. Yeah, well said. Like we're never really taught to apply this to our personal life and our relationships. Well said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, okay, that goes into a really important um, area of interest, which is masculinity. And and so, what given what we're talking about, this kind of canceling of the feminine and some of the limitations of the masculine. And so I want to engage in almost a, a public service announcement to talk about what we tend to say, you know, when I do men's work, you know, we talk about how the longest distance that a lot of men travel is the distance between their head and their heart, you know, that, mm -hmm. that also interpreting, learning how to interpret that discomfort. The, I love, I love how you're framing it as intelligence because most of the men that I've experienced, myself included in a lot of ways, feel that discomfort and it is framed as discomfort and immediately go into solutions about how mm -hmm. to make that go away as quickly as possible. And on, on one hand, it can be highly effective by mm -hmm. when you're navigating problematic issues, when you're, you know, it is very solution focused. Mm -hmm. And it also certainly others the body and mm -hmm. that intelligence system. So riff on that what for a, a bit. Beautiful to other the body. That's a beautiful, that's a that's a really powerful mm -hmm. phrasing right there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I never even thought of that. That's really something. Mm -hmm. When a man for a man in that condition, first of all, let's just have a tremendous amount of of I feel very sad thinking about how mm -hmm. how many signals so many men get that what they feel doesn't matter. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, there are, there are, you know, there's a study from, I think it was Columbia. It could be wrong. It's a, it was a Latin American or it was a, it was a country in a Spanish speaking country in the Southern hemisphere or the Northern hemisphere it was Mexico. I don't remember which one that talked about how women perpetuate machismo in their children because there's so much shaming and blaming around what it means to be a woman, that that's mm. the last thing that a woman would ever, they don't want any of that to show up in their sons. There's a lot of research around that exactly. Mm. So the first thing I want to acknowledge is that, you know, in the conditioning that most men in our culture get, the, you know, they say that the manning of a boy begins as soon as he's swaddled, you know, oh, as soon as wow. he's born. Yeah, mm -hmm. the manning of a boy. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to say is let's really honor the brain in this, and that that the 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 agility of this linear pursuit hemisphere and one of the powers of it, a superpower of it, is solutions and problem solving. Yeah. And so there is definitely a nature and a nurture here happening. Again, it's a, I'm a broken record. You know, there's biology, there's <laughs> environment, and there's conditioning. It's nature. You know, when people say, well, is that nature and nurture? It's like, yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, it is. But what I would offer to men who would look for an offer in a situation like that would be, first of all, Just, I think I would just say first, just to slow down and let the feelings be a form of intelligence. And then what I would hope that I could offer as a woman is when something like that, if something like that were to happen to me, I would want to really 
honor probably the intention like a man who shows up and gives me a solution he, he may be doing the very best he knows how to do and i have a phrase i really believe in and that is you can't be angry with anyone for not meeting a need you haven't expressed you have mm. and i think that's really important to remember not only mm -hmm. interpersonally or individually but sort that's of sad. societally and I think women, they might not have the voice to say right now, like, what I really need is to be seen and listened to. Mm -hmm. What I really need is to just, you know, have space held or something like that. Or I maybe just need to reflect on this for a little while longer, because reflection, by the way, is one of the great gifts. Reflection and consideration and then a higher solution is one of the great gifts of the right hemisphere. But I think a new conversation around this better together, and again, you know, indigenous wisdom, a new conversation on this is really, I think, one of our best paths to problem solving and to growth. Was that anything like a response that that filled in some space? Was that, I don't yeah. want to pin it down and say an answer, but. No, no, it did. Um, I, I really like a, a couple of things, you know, but mainly it's your attitude to it, which um, feels very present and. Um, and I do think that's a that's a very significant issue is how frequently men are, whether they're conscious or not, they are looking for the threat, for the perceived threat. Wow. Oh, I think that's right. Wow, 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 wow. And I think I would map that to what we were saying about the guy we were both trying to have empathy for back in the, the witch burnings. Totally, totally. Yeah, and that like he is like, okay, what if they think I'm soft? Yes. What if they think I have a girly side? What if they think I'm a witch? Am I going to be the next one to be burned? And this is, again, that hierarchy of domination, mm -hmm. right? And it's a zero-sum game mm -hmm. because you're never, like, it's it's like, even in my, when I often talk with groups about this, I say the goal, I don't think the goal is equality, because equality is always chase. Oh, they're a little more equal on this. You're always chasing. And that's linear pursuit, left hemispheric. Mm. It really is mutuality. And that is bringing together the best of the sides. And, you know, John, I listen to myself sometimes. And I go like, well, it's so like, is it too idealistic? I think a few years ago, I might have said that it was. As I look at all that we're facing right now, it's the only thing I can see that offers a possible path to a future that we want to be part of. Uh, so so let me piggyback on that and say, where does conflict and tension fall into this? You know, mm -hmm. like, because there, there, there is, a, and maybe it's in opposition to what you're saying, because you're saying mutuality. Yeah. And so mutuality means that if somebody's different or is offering some different perspective, that there's value in that. The conflict right. is opposition, and so you're right. you're in a you're in a defended yeah. space already. I may be answering my question already, but but I I do appreciate dominance and mutuality as our kind of conversation images, as opposed to polarity and right conflict. Yeah. You know, yeah. And but friction can be really fun. Totally. Well. Yeah. Like <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. as a matter of fact, the brain seems to engage in pretty cool ways when there's a little bit of stress. Yeah, stress. Absolutely. Yeah. So what I would say is that the substrate to friction, and I, I don't think we're here in, in the culture at all, is a sense of psychological safety. Like we are not safe with each other, clearly. Mm -hmm. And I think because we are not safe with each other, we see a couple of patterns. One is the polarity that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Another is that we fake things out to be comfortable with each other, politically mm -hmm. correct, or, right. you know, like we don't go, we don't know. Because, we, we, and comfort, I actually think can be really dangerous, mm. right? So for example, I felt, for, when you said this thing about the, when we were talking about penetrative sex yeah, and- yeah. The use of the word, well, the man penetrates the woman, which I yeah. see it very different. I see totally. it really differently than that. And so we are safe. I, I think you and I even said in that conversation, well, we're safe with each other. Yes. So we have engaged in a thing where we say, John and I, we, you know, we're still getting to know each other. We have different outlooks. We we come from different worlds. We see each other, but we're safe with each other. We mm -hmm. there's respect, right? 
there's honor to you as a person. So I don't need to put on a show so that I'm comfortable with you. And I certainly feel that it would be a limitation of our potential in our connection if I just agreed with you so you could be comfortable with yourself. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. That would be that would be an abdication of my that would actually be a compromise to my values. Yeah. Now there are some times where I might not there there's there, there, there are times when I might say, okay, I can't feel safe with this person or this can't, this is not able to be a safe conversation. I won't participate in that conversation. Mm -hmm. I'll take care of myself. So, and, but I also will not make anyone comfortable at my own expense. And I think this is a really important thing for us all to remember. Mm -hmm. We don't have to compromise ourselves to make other fe people feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. If that's happening, we're not safe and we see we see where this is getting us. We're, mm -hmm. we're all kind of, again, kind of mind fucking each other in all kinds of unnecessary and unintelligent ways. Pardon my French. No, it's, Although I don't it's think a, it's French. No, well said. It's actually English. Yeah. I appreciate it. You know, then my daughter can say, hey, daddy, is fuck a bad word? You know, I'll say, eh, you know, no, <laughs> depending on how you use it. Um, yeah. So um, the, the thing, I, I want to go back to that same question. You know, we were talking about what what can you offer men and and i think like to flip it also and say what 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 are men needing to offer to women and and how can that process be seen as more mutual mm. as opposed to mm. the the tension that we're talking about the fear i so appreciate that question and let me think about this for a moment and i'm as i'm thinking about it i'm also thinking about the the brain right yeah. and the hemispheres so let's start what what can men offer to women? I would invite them to consider slowing down mm -hmm. and to remembering it's not all about outcome. And if they can suspend outcome for a moment, getting it right, getting it fixed, getting it better, you know, a lot of the problems we look at in certainly in relationships aren't really solvable, you know, uh -huh. it's just yeah. part of the, the journey. So I would say uh, make space for reflection. I, I'm going to throw a really weird question out there that, you know, I, I wonder how you'll respond when I, I offer it. Just go, huh, thanks for raising that. I'd like a little time to think about that and mm -hmm. then walk away. What would happen? Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm really asking from a genuine place. Mm -hmm. What might happen? If you said that to me? Well, if, if you I said, said that, that to you? Me, if you were speaking, if a man, uh, uh, theoretical yeah, I mean, man, yeah, you're 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 talking about. I mean, you're you're kind of on to some of my dynamic. I mean, I'm a fast moving person, and I can sometimes mm -hmm. you know get going. Mm -hmm. And I, I I feel you know I think it's probably a really wise decision for me to to do that more often, just to even balance my own responses. Yeah. You know, then then I can't add a thing to what you said. One hundred percent, you would receive a gift from that. Yeah, I think it's you know in the great RPG role playing game of life. Yes. <laughs> Moments like that are the jewel, right? Yes. That's the jewel in the room right there. Yeah. Okay, what if I try this? What is available to me? You're actually activating new pathways, new potential mm -hmm. pathways in the brain in ways that actually increase your access to everything you've already learned about what it takes to be safe, alive, smart, and John mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't Who wouldn't want more of that? Yeah. God, and then I think well, so women... Yeah, what women can do, we have to really honor that, like the intention of a man offering us a solution is probably a, a good intent. I mean, at least some of the time, a good intention. Sometimes I've seen where it's just like, oh my God, could you just stop talking about that? That's a different type of pattern that, you know, we could chase around through different types yeah. of conversation. But they, they, it's basically, um, it, very often it has seemed to me, a man is offering me a gift through the way that he's thinking. What is my resistance to receiving it? And sometimes that's legitimate. Uh, it's I, I, I love transactional analysis. Mm -hmm. You know that form? Of, I love it. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing psychological form. But there's a game I've mapped out, and I've watched men start the game, and I've watched women start the game. Both of us do it, right? But it's a game that I call Guess What I Want, so I can tell you you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And so very often, then we, we, this is a, it's a real invitation that we're, what we're doing is we're activating in those child and parent ego states, which inherently mm -hmm. are conflictual. Right. 
So guess what I want so I can tell you're wrong. I've definitely seen people, both genders, who will name an unsolvable or a nuanced or a situation they haven't thought through well enough and talk with someone about it. A person with best intent will offer something to help, but because they haven't fully processed or thought through it, no matter what is offered is going to be wrong. That's, yeah. that's just, that's just not going to work for anybody. Right. Yeah. That's a tough game to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, it's an impossible game to win. Right. Well, I'm not going to say impossible. The way to win is just say, look, this seems like something that needs more time. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you need right now while we both think about it? Gosh, I don't know. Well, as, as we're starting to uh, close out a bit and, and kind of wrap things up, I, I want to reflect on our conversation and see what little threads are hanging out there that we need to open up to. What mm -hmm. What's hanging on for you? Hmm. Oh, I think it's just, wow, it's just a very, very deep longing for us to remember who we really are. Mm. And to take that, the responsibility that our many gifts of being human have given us and all the things that those who came before us have worked for. And just to catch our breath for a minute. Right mm -hmm. to pause ourselves to sort of see if we can just find maybe one more breath or one a little bit of stillness in the world so we can remember who we are. That's that's what's coming up for me. Oh, at at the risk of opening up a whole volcano, um, you said it earlier, and I, I want to certainly see where we go with this. But you mentioned psychedelics. And of course, indigenous tradition and psychedelics in our culture. Oh. And what what are your thoughts on what's happening oh. right now in the world of psychedelics? I'm so grateful mm -hmm. for what is emerging in psychedelic use right now. You know, there's so many things out there, John, that you know about, you know, co-evolving with psilocybin and da 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 and you know, all of these things you know, the, the the long arc of human history has been interwoven with the use of various mind altering or consciousness expanding or, mm -hmm. you know, sort of shape shifting, not only things we ingest into our body, but even trance states and yeah. deep meditations and, you know, long-term training to just, in a way, activate or reactivate some of the incredible potential of you know, mm -hmm. this this thing that I'm waving my hands over right now, the brain. What I love about uh, the, the intentional use of psychedelics right now is that it can remind us that there is so much more to this mystery of life than we normally see. And, um, you know, it's funny, I, I was with a group of really wonderful people earlier this year who happened to be talking about psychedelics. And one of them asked the question of our little group of five or six people who are, who are chatting, you know, what are you most excited about this, this year in the realm of psychedelics? And I said, um, first timers. Mm -hmm. I really think that with the right sort of intentionality, the right sort of circumstances, for people to experience an expanded sense of themselves and even to touch on a little bit of a remembering of that sacred um, is one of the most transformative experiences that I think is available to us right now. And in my own studies of, you know, the use of psychedelics and how they affect people, you know, psychologically or if they're used in therapeutic or trauma addressing um capacities very very wonderful but also those who explore to just feel a broader realm of life than might be mm -hmm. available in this more conditioned plane i i see everyone come back with a little more softness in a really beautiful way than they they a little more uncertainty which is a really neat quality uncertainty mm -hmm. begets curiosity right than they might have gone in with. And that's that's really very inspiring to me. Such a good note. 
that's that's kind of why I I wanted to dive into the study of psychedelics in the first place. I just think we have so much just by studying it and this collision of all these different territories mm -hmm. of anthropology and neuroscience and so oh yeah you know, everything it it but it does seem to beget that kind of wow it's not it's not quite what. Yeah. We yeah, it to it's be. it's so great. The other thing that it does now that you mentioned, and I I just watched Zoom give you a thumbs up. Let's see if we can give. I was I was you know giving yeah. the no look. Yeah. That was the AI going. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I want to say is I really feel <laughs> that the use of psychedelics also softens some of the divides. Uh huh. Yeah. And even if we only come back with 5% or, you know, I often say in my work, like 5% changes are huge. Like, yeah. let's just really aim for 5%. Even if we come back with 5% more uncertainty or curiosity or willingness to, huh, we're already changing the world. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's Lucky us. Yeah. That's a good place to conclude. Is there anything else that you can think of that we need to? Yeah, that feels. I really just good. want to say thank you. <laughs> Excuse me, thank you, and I hope we can do this again sometime. You're a joy, Ellen. It's really good. Uh, this has been a long time in the make, so it's good to sit with you. Really good. Thank, thank you. you. And you know, I also want to call out for you, like even having this to look forward to and think about has been really wonderful for me because. Mm -hmm. It has let me listen to some of your other guests and weave some of that wisdom and learning together and use it to sort of, I don't know, sort of add some facets to the things that really, really thank are you. fun to explore. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Love